Hello, everybody. It's Rossine here. I'm having difficulty putting my head in. Uh, we have a big gang with us today. I'm delighted to have our colleagues from uh, across the system who work really in QPS generally. So they're here today to talk to us on the Incident Man Management Framework 2018. So exploring new approaches to incident review. Nice. So just a little bit about our speakers. We've Loretta and Siobhan, if you give the, the crowd a wave. <laughs> they both work in the Quality Assurance and Verification Division. And then we have Annette Logan, who is the QPS Manager. Um, oh, saying that the sound is a little bit. Lisa, I hope you can hear OK. Be using the phone for the sign, so just type in the chat box if you're having continual problem, OK? Um, the phone number and the code is in the chat box there, so just try that. So we have Annette. She's working down in Cork, Kerry Community Healthcare, and leads the team there. And she's also working in the area of QPS. And we have Una O'Grady, who is working in Community, community Healthcare West, Golly Roscommon, Ross and she's a QPS advisor there covering mental health services. So we'll hear a, a raft of experience from frontline services as well. So just a little bit of introduction um, to the webinar platform. The phone number and event number is there. So if you're having difficulty hearing it over the computer, you can also phone in and use the event code to type in. Um, so follow the, the instructions when you phone in and just type in that number and you'll get into the webinar. Please type in and let us know that you can hear us okay. Um, so also there will be time for questions and answers and we're going to keep it quite informal. So um, as we go along, any questions that pop into your head, stick them into the chat box and we'll deal with them as we go along. Um, we are on Twitter, so the, it's at, at QI Talk Time. This will also be recorded and the slide set will be up available for people to watch afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the rest of the team to get going on the content and hope you enjoy today's talk time. Thanks, Rushing. Okay, so um, I'll just give an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so the first bit will be just providing the context, which is introducing the incident management framework. Um, the review panel approach is one of the new approaches in the framework. And then we're going to hear some service perspectives. So we're going to hear from Annette and Ona about their practical experience um, using the review panel approach. And then Loretta is going to talk about some of the training that we've developed in the Office of Quality, Risk and Safety to support this review panel approach. And as Roshan said, we'll have um, Q&A probably throughout. Okay, so the incident management framework, I'm sure everybody's aware at this stage that the incident management framework was launched last January. So it's been in place for a year. Um, it applies to all incidents occurring in publicly funding, funded health and social care services provided in Ireland. And that includes hospital groups, community health organizations, national services like the National Ambulance Service, the Screening Service, and also HSE-funded care, so those agencies um, funded by Section 38 and 39 of the legislation. So it has a huge scope, um, and um, I think everybody is aware that when you're managing an incident, there is a six-step process, um, and we'll be drilling it deeper into step five, which is the review and analysis. Um, but just, it's important to say that um, the assumption when you're choosing this approach is that you have the rest, the previous steps in place. So the first step in your managing an incident is having your safety culture. Um, and that's really important because um, we know that we will learn from incidents when people are supported to report them. So it's important that staff do report incidents so that reviews can happen and that we can learn from them. Um, we also think step two is a really important step in the process, and that, that's what happens when you identify um, an incident um, and the immediate actions that are taken. So that includes supporting the people involved, so supporting the person harmed, and also supporting any staff that, that were involved in the incident. Um, step three, then, is the initial reporting and notification. 
Um, and the detail behind all these steps are um, laid out in the incident management framework. Step four is where you come to assess the incident and categorize it. And that informs decision making about what approach you might take to manage the incident. Mm -hmm. Um, so the approach we're talking about today is the review panel approach, um, and that is used for um, a serious incident or an incident that is categorized and assessed as a category one incident in the framework. Um, so as I said, we'll be talking more about the, the review panel approach, um, and that provides um, an opportunity for reviewing the incident, finding out what happened, um, and also anal analyzing um, the, the why and the how the incident happened in order to see if there is any learning that can be put into place to make um, services safer. The last step in the incident management process is improvement planning and monitoring, and that's nearly closing the loop. So um, looking at the, the what happened, the why, ha why it happened, and seeing if there is any learning that needs to be put in place to make services safer and, and how the service might do that. So in the framework, there are a number of approaches to reviewing incidents. Um, the, the incident management framework replaces the HSE safety incident management um, policy of 2016. Um, and in that policy, there was one approach um, which used systems analysis. Um, so it was um, um, an investigation approach. Um, and the policy um, was very clear on the steps to take. Um, in order to do that. The incident management framework induce, introduces more approaches. Most of them still use a systems analysis methodology because that is um, a very appropriate way to look at the system. Um, so the whole system that, that, that led up um, to the incident or whatever went wrong. Um, so there is the review team approach, which is um, probably the most similar approach to, to one that was used in the previous policy. Um, there are also approaches, the multidisciplinary team approach is where um, the team is facilitated to review what happens. There is a desktop approach which is used primarily for legacy cases. Um, there, is all, there are also two incident specific tools that have been developed. Um, one is for falls and the other is for pressure ulcer review. And then there's an aggregate review approach. And um, the last one then there is the review panel approach that we'll be talking about. Um, so all of those approaches use the systems analysis methodology. Um, and then another approach is the after action review. Um, and we will be um, addressing that at the next webinar on the 19th of February. So just getting into the review panel approach, as I said, it is used to review category one incidents. Um, and category one incidents are those that um, need to be notified to the senior accountable officer um, within 24 hours. And then the senior accountable officer, which um, could be the hospital manager or the chief mm -hmm. officer in um, a, a CHO. So the senior accountable officer commissions the review um, and then some of the work that's done then is to develop the terms of reference. Um, the, the senior accountable officer then nominates a case officer um, who gathers preliminary information to inform decision making. Now, um, I know Annette and Ona are going to talk a bit more about the case officer's role, but it's generally somebody from QPS. It doesn't have to be, um, but we'll hear a little bit more about that later. The senior accountable officer also identifies um, panel members and convenes a meeting of the serious incident management team, or the SIN. Um, and governance of the process stays with the serious incident management team until the review um, concludes. So after the panel has been established, so um, the, the members have been identified and agreed to take part in this approach. The case officer links in with the chair and begins gathering information for the case report. And that can include any notes of, the, of any meeting that has been held with the person harmed or the family, um, which is very useful to, to um, go through any questions that they might have and that they would like addressed in the review. 
Um, the case report also includes notes of any staff recollections, um, and that that um, um, they are 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 used so that staff can write down what happened um, or their perspective on on what happened. Um, and the case report can include notes of any other meetings um, that that happened with staff. The next thing then is to agree a date for the review panel to meet. And generally, um, the panel would have a week to review um, the, the case report. Um, so in, in the incident management framework, the time frame is generally um, the case officer has um, um, six weeks to um, gather the information and then um, set the date for the panel, and the panel have a week to, to review. So, um, the, the case report is circulated a week before the meeting. Again, the case report includes any background relating to the person harmed and to their, their history of attending the service. Um, it also um, describes the what happened or the chronology of events that, that, that led up to the incident um, and the detail of the immediate steps taken in relation to the incident management. And that refers back to to step two in the six step process, um, which is about the, the, the steps that were put in place to, to provide support to the person harmed and to um, um, any staff involved in the incident. Um, so that's part of gathering the information. Then when it comes to the meeting, the case officer provides a short overview of systems analysis, so the methodology um, and, and its purpose. Um, presents the case report to the panel, and then facilitates a, a discussion to discuss the case um, and look at the information that has been, been, been provided, um, and facilitates the panel to reach consensus on the key causal factors um, and address any contributory factors using the Yorkshire Contributory Factors Framework. And that's the framework that is recommended in the Incident Management Framework. Um, and it addresses all the factors in, in the, the, the system that led up to um, the incident. Um, the panel then also have an opportunity to address any questions that the person harmed or the family have raised um, and to consider recommendations that if put in place will make the service safer. <coughs> After the meeting then, the case officer drafts the review report for the panel and circulates the draft to anyone involved in line with due process, um, and also um, arranges a meeting with the service user or the family um, to discuss the report, to make sure that any questions that were raised by them have been included. Um, the case officer generally meets with the chair, and then the report goes to the series incident management team or the SIN as per the government approval process. And again, that's all laid out in the incident management framework. Can I just ask there, um, and just, just something that struck me there, uh, it seems a lot to get through in one meeting and to come up with recommendations straight mm -hmm. away from one meeting. Is it always the case that it happens after one, or can there be numerous meetings to I've come never, up with? I've never had a successful completion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. And so I think the, realistic to yeah. I think the important thing to remember is that the incident management framework is a framework. So it allows services the flexibility, um, and I, I probably should have said that at the beginning. So when, when we talk about the scope, um, it's huge. So it's a national, poli national policy framework, or a national framework, and I should say framework because that word was picked very specifically because it allows local services um, yeah. to adapt. Yeah. 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 And we would actually have met with the family twice as well. So on one occasion, we would have had a copy of the draft report, um, and then we would have presented the final report to them as well. So it isn't just one meeting. They get uh, input into it throughout the process as well, so that worked quite well. Yeah, okay. Great. I think that's why it's really useful to have Ona and Annette here to hear the actual practical experience, because mm -hmm. the framework can set out what, what's nice in, in theory and then the practical experience. And also, I, suppose I should say that we are planning um, not a full evaluation of the framework, but a quick review of the framework because it has been in place for 12 months at this stage. Mm -hmm. And we want to ask people what's going well, what's not going so well, mm -hmm. to inform any changes that we need Great. to make. Um, yeah. 
So I think things like this will come up in that review and we'll be able to, to um, address that in, in the framework. Okay, so the report goes to the SIM as per the governance approval process. Um, and just, just to, to close off my bit, these are the strengths that have been identified in the framework of this approach. That, that the strengths are that it is comprehensive, it's thorough, um, it does incorporate principles of systems analysis, um, and that it supports patient safety by identifying key causal factors and contributory factors. And also that it involves the perspective of a multidisciplinary panel of subject experts. Um, another of the strengths is that it is timely, so it can be done quicker than the other approach um, that is used for, for a category one, so the review team approach. Um, and I think that's the beauty of the approach, that it can happen quicker. But we hear from the girls about the reality of, of, of how quickly it does, does happen. So some of the weaknesses that are identified in the IMF is that some services can find it challenging to appoint that panel of, of experts. Um, so if we move on to hear from the practical experience from Annette and then Ona. Um, okay, so in Quartary Community Health Care, um, when we um, started using the review panel approach first, um, there were the obvious challenges around its hesitation around using a new approach, which would be, you know, realistic for any new new um, process being undertaken. Um, there was a level of reassurance that we had to provide to the serious incident management team, and they were very familiar with using a systems analysis approach and used to that methodology. So it's useful that the review panel approach actually is underpinned by the systems analysis methodology as well. So it actually made it quite, um, you know, it, it was a good framework as well to, to pitch it at. Um, again, as you outlined earlier, Siobhan, selecting the appropriate panel members can be problematic depending on the service that you're in. Um, the complexity of the case, so in our situation, um, we had quite a complex case with very distressed family members, um, and there also was a delay in starting the review process, so um, we have to take that into consideration. Initially, um, we had a, a really high demand for systems analysis investigation that take a considerably long time. This is one of the cases waiting um, to be put through that process, and we selected it as part of the panel review approach because we said it would just speed up things. Um, and is there a, a, a method of prioritization or prioritization? matrix to go and say Yeah, so we'd look at the category one incidents initially, um, and then obviously some of the investigations would have commenced already, so we wouldn't revert back to change in the approach, but it's where people have been, we were unfortunately stacking and racking, and because we had a few of them to get, and it's very difficult to get investigation to the members. So we really looked at those that have been outstanding for quite a while, um, and, and we selected that particular case for that reason. Um, Managing expectations is another big um, area we have to look at. So we have to manage the expectations of the panel review, um, the people involved there, um, the family members as well. Um, very important to outline to them the process. And um, within our case, because there's been a delay in starting, we had given commitments around mm -hmm. really agreed timelines. And then it was just making sure that we stick to those and can't be retracting again when they've already been a delay. So it's a major challenge around getting that done. Um, so I'll just move on to the next. Thank you. So, uh, so just to tell you what worked well, um, we had terms of reference that had been approved by the SIMT, um, and that was essential, including identifying the chairperson and the role there. Um, our case officer was absolutely essential to, to the process, and she did a huge amount of work there, not only gathering all the information and preparing draft reports, but just supporting the actual review team as well, um, and that they understood what was required of them. Um, um, sorry, yep. I got in again, but just sure. in terms of the case manager, the yep. only guide here to, yep. to getting or recruiting a case manager. How so in our area, yeah, so in our area so far, um, we've only done three panel reviews, and it has been a chief of advisor has been the case officer. Um, on the scent side of it, then if they're on the case officer side, I sit on the scent, but they still keep us representation as a serious incident management team piece, but they're not involved in the scent. They take a step back and they support the review panel. And that, that seems to work quite well so far. Um, the family liaison person, because it was a complex case, I took on the lead role there around um, liaising with the family. And a member of the SEMT, one of the senior clinicians, would have accompanied me to those meetings as well. Um, communication, again, was, was absolutely critical um, in terms of communicating with the staff who are at the centre of the um, incident, and communicating with the family and the, the panel review themselves as well. 
um, input from the family and services were, was, um, was actually essential in this instance. Um, we were given a list of questions um, from the family members, some of which would have been picked up if you were doing a review with a systems analysis methodology, but there were other questions that I felt may not have come through if you were looking at it from a systematic um, perspective, and it was good that we were able to put those questions to the review panel to get their take on it and to provide you know, expert advice and guidance on that as well, and to provide a response. Um, so looking back at the managing expectations piece, I had to be very clear with the family members that we would take their list of questions into consideration. They weren't guaranteed to get the answer to every question, and they may not like the answer that went to every question, so it just had to be very clear about how, what, how that would work. Um, staff cooperation in, in this case was essential also, um, and again, that was on the back of really good communication, both from their line management structure and from the, the review panel. Um, the availability of documentation and information, again, Kate Office has played a large role in this, gathering the relevant documentation, um, outlining the chronology and so on, which was really, really important. Um, keeping to the agreed timelines, again, absolutely essential, um, both from a service perspective for us to get the, the, the review completed, um, and we're also taking up our review panel consisted of four clinicians, so they have the day-to-day -day work to do as well, so it was really critical that we kept to that. And as I alluded to earlier as well, the approach is underpinned by the systems analysis uh, methodology, so that gave reassurance about identifying key causal um, contributory factors and so on. A couple of questions yeah, that we might sure. take, and I just think nicely, yeah. I think it's the practical elements, the practicalities mm -hmm. of setting this up. The one that just struck me is the family liaison person, yeah. and you spoke to how a TPS person, in this example, yeah. it was TPS plus a clinical person. Yes. Just wondering, you know, is it advisable to always have a clinical person with you? Um, liaison, I think it depends on the context of the case. So in this um, particular case, there were some very specific clinical questions that the family would have had, and then I felt it was important that there was someone at the table who could give an answer to those. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you know, you don't want to be saying to people, come in and have a, a chat with us and sit down and have a conversation and not be able to give some immediate feedback to them. So it was, I, felt, I felt it was beneficial having a, a senior clinician at the table. I think it, it, can, it can be done on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. as well. Um, I suppose um, from people in QPS, I suppose it's important that families know that, that um, our role is to support the process yeah. rather mm. than answer the clinical question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so being clear on roles and clarity on that from the outset. Yeah. But it's reassuring people that if you don't have the answer to hand, that you can get it. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, that's good. Um, Rob Connolly has a question here, so he's saying it may be covered later in the WebEx, but in relation to the review panel, um, does the panel membership usually include the local teams or staff members or others who were directly involved in the incident? Not in, no. So we don't have anyone who's directly involved in the incident, um, and we use some people who would be local to the local in terms of an area remit, but not local to the service. You just need that step removed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, Another question from Patricia O'Brien: How is the case officer selected? Is the person specific to a particular incident, or does the same person tend to end up managing several incidents? Um, I suppose each area is probably different in terms of what resources they have. Um, but at the moment where, where I'm based, is there is a, a significant number of serious incidents within the mental health services, and I'm the only GPS advisor in that area, so it does fall to me. Um, now, we have made a decision recently that some of my colleagues in some of the other divisions may help out if they have some time to, to help because you just end up doing incident management and you don't get to do any other part of your role. But I think mental health is kind of like that yeah. across the country. So generally the, the case officer is someone from QPS, but it doesn't have to be. So I think it's important to yeah. say that as well. It doesn't have to be, but generally it does. And is there guidance on that in terms of what the role, the remit is in the framework? Is there guidance to tell people to be a case manager, you need to be this or you need to have these? The framework really um, details what the case officer does yeah, for their role as opposed to who. Yeah, yeah, okay. Perfect, okay. So people can look that up. Um, I'm sure we have the links um, for people to follow up on that. 
So keep the questions coming, that's great. Okay, so um, in terms of essential requirements, um, preparation is um, definitely key. Um, there is, there's no point going to meetings without having all of the documentation there. Um, you definitely need time to review the documentation prior to the panel review meetings. Um, case officer guidance and support was absolutely essential in, in the process. Um, sticking to the process. So there are very clear um, guidelines as to what a review panel um, is to look like. So really just stick to the process to just make it so much easier. Um, engagement with key stakeholders, also very, very important. Um, so that, I suppose that staff members are clear what a panel review is and what the expectations are around them. Um, again, communication with all key stakeholders as well around family members, staff members, and the um, review panel. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Just, um, I just want to touch on a point Rob is following up on about, um, he's saying it's a good point um, regarding the family being made aware that they may not like the answers to the questions. I presume the same caveat applies to staff members and others involved in the incident. In relation to this, are patients, families, staff briefed as part of the process um, that it may not be possible to answer all questions and where answers are provided that they may not be what they are expecting or hoping for. So are patients, families, staff briefed as part of the process that it may not be possible to answer yeah. all? I think that's part of step two as yeah. well. Um, that um, as part of the, the family meetings, it's important that the family, that the, the expectation of the family are managed, that, that they're involved in the process and they're involved in the journey, that there are questions, they give you your questions, but rightly so as well, that the, they're told that, that it's discussed with them that you may not get the answer that you want to hear, and we will try and find out the information, but you, we may find the information, but you may not be happy with the answer that, that you get back. But it's important for people to feel that the process is fair, mm -hmm. and that's what's detailed in the, the review panel approach in the IMS. Yeah, and so similarly to the system of analysis investigation, um, draft report, so the draft report is provided to the staff members to give feedback and to make sure it's actually accurate. Um, and, and likewise, when we met with family on two occasions, they got a draft report to have a look at to make sure whatever information they provided to us was actually accurate and that it represented what they had said to us. And equally, the staff were afforded the same opportunity to have a look at what is being said and how it's being said and is that reflective of what they um, informed the review panel at the time. And that's set out, there's a, there's a process set out for all the reports that are written um, for reviews in the incident management framework. So that's the government, govern, <laughs> governance approval process. Uh, so Cornelia Stewart is online too, and she's asking, in the review panel, or actually she's stating that in the review panel approach, members are independent to the incident. Alternatively, the MDT approach involves independent facilitation of staff who are associated with the incident. Yeah, so that, that's pretty clear there. And there's just one more question before we move on. So from Kira Norton, she's asking, what is the engagement and experience with PALS and independent patient advocates? Do you have the advocates at the, at the meeting? Um, so I'm not really sure if I'm going to answer this correctly, but I'll, I'll make a stab at it. Um, so we don't have a patient advocate, at, or I haven't had the experience of having a patient advocate at the meeting. However, um, the family members that we did meet with, they were afforded an opportunity to bring someone with them. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to bring an advocate, that was no problem. Um, it depends, yeah, it depends on the case. I haven't done enough of them to say that there's been a formal engagement with an advocate service. Um, but if, if the family member or service user wants to bring an advocate, there's absolutely no problem with that. Um, so in terms of um, learning, um, I, I can't reiterate it um, often enough, the case officer plays a critical role. Um, input from the family or service user um, enables the review panel to answer relevant questions which may not be otherwise addressed um, if you're just looking from a systems perspective. Um, the approach is less confrontational for staff, service users and the review panel themselves. Um, family, service user involvement aided the process in our case. 
and timely access to inf information was absolutely essential. So those were the key learning points from our experience so far within the CHO. Thank you. Um, I hope I'm not uh, reiterating a lot of what Annette has said already, um, but I'm basing, I suppose, most of this on one or two particular cases that we had looked at. Um, and I suppose when, when this framework came in initially, it was, I think, very much welcomed. Um, I've worked in private and public uh, QPS risk management sector for a long time, and a lot of the time you're just kind of going blind into scenarios, sometimes unsure what you're doing. So it's really, really good to have some guidance out there, albeit a framework, but at least there's direction in terms of support for QPS advisors and managers. Um, in relation to the one or two cases, there was one particular case that we used, and it didn't fit into what is known as a Category 1 incident. It was actually Category 2, but it was a complex case. Um, and for that reason, we decided to do the review panel approach um, so I think the preliminary assessment and the gathering of information at that pre-step uh, is very, very important so that you have the preliminary assessment is as concise as possible so that the stint are making an informed decision in terms of you know, what information do we have at the moment. Is this a case where we do need to go in and interview staff or will we get enough from the information that, w that we have as presented by the case officer? Um, so the complexity of the case is really important. Um, and the number of staff or services or other agencies. Sometimes if it's too complicated, you may need to go down the road of the old systems analysis approach. Um, so you need to be very well informed before even making that decision in terms of what type of approach to use. Um, so go on to the next one. So in terms of the experience in uh, mental health services in CHO2, I suppose, again, you know, it's always really exciting to use a new approach, but also very daunting because you're not sure how well you deliver it, how well you facilitate. Um, and uh, in, in this particular case, it was a very positive experience. And I think it's really good that the, most of the methods, or all of them, are underpinned by the systems analysis methodology. So that gives it... Um, that trust uh, and just uh, kind of uh, systems approach there. Um, I think we need to be very practical and reasonable, and yes, there are time frames that we try and adhere to, but um, I, I'm not aware of any review process that has met the targets yet. Um, and as you said earlier, Roisin, you know, thinking that we're getting this completed in one meeting, I, I've yet to do that. Um, two or three meetings is kind of more reasonable um, and on a couple of occasions you may get through the meeting maybe two meetings um, and then the report and the compiling of the report and getting that factual accuracy pieces back from people that can delay the process and I've seen that delayed by a month or two at times where you're maybe waiting for one review panel or one clinician who you were you may have dealt with and um, that you're waiting for them to come back to you so unfortunately there can be delays despite, you know, your best intention. In terms of the challenges, and, and again, I think, you know, as Annette said, preparation is so important. And the role of the case officer um, is, is quite complicated as well because you're there to educate the review panel a lot of the time. Um, there may be, time, be times where you have reviewers who have gone on systems analysis one day training, but that could have been three years ago and they've never used those skills. So you're going back to the basics. And... I suppose in my experience, you nearly wait, not enough wait, but if you have one day to do this meeting, a huge two to three hours could nearly be given to trying to go back over what is this analysis about, what are key causal factors about, what, you know, what's the evaluation and the mapping, um, and that's going to be very time consuming if you're only given one meeting. Um, just to interrupt, some people online might not be aware of what the systems analysis training is. Is that something that's available to people to yeah. sort of talk about training? Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll let Loretta and yeah. Siobhan discuss yeah. that or outline that. Um, so in terms of time as well, I think what I found from experience is trying to nearly foresee some of the clinical questions that the clinical experts will want to know of. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, and my background isn't in mental health, so it's very difficult to try and, 
nearly prompt what they would be looking for. Um, and I think it's, it's important to try and, while you're gathering all of that information and you're putting it into your chronological order and you're giving the background in terms of your case report, if you want to get that as much out of that one or two meetings, you nearly, nearly need to foresee clinically, which isn't always possible. So you, for me, I'm not sure how one meeting would really uh, round off the whole process. Um, and I think it's important as well to use the framework as a framework and agree that sometimes you may need to blend different approaches depending on the complexity of the case. And that's not always apparent at the stint. Sometimes that only becomes apparent as the review panel meet and go through some of the documentation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to have be cognizant of that as well. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the benefits, and I, I think it has been a, a really good um, experience mm -hmm. so far. Um, I think it's you know still underpinning the, um, the systems analysis approach where you know we're trying to have a just culture um, so that it's open and transparent where it's not shining a light. Um, from a negative perspective and even still I, I'm meeting a consultant next week to do a preliminary assessment um, and he has, I'm trying to be very supportive and he has said he has never been dealt with in a supportive manner before and I'm, he isn't believing you know that yeah. the culture is changing and that we're moving towards this, this um, I suppose just culture. Um, I think it's really important to say that it yeah. is a culture shift. Mm -hmm. It is. And the framework has only been in place for 12 months. Um, so that we know that it's going to take time to embed it yeah. fully. But we're on a journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is still fear and defensiveness out there. And hopefully we can change that. Yeah. Um, I suppose the other thing in terms of benefits is it should be more efficient and it should be more timely. For everybody, you know, one particular case that I used this approach in was a, was a staff incident. So, so we didn't have that family liaison requirement, but the staff member needed to be supported. It was an assault on a staff member. So that, uh, that member of staff needed to be supported and needed to be brought along on that journey as well. Um, and that was very important. But for the review panel, it's uh, less time consuming for them as opposed to the old uh, systems analysis approach because the QPS advisor is doing a huge amount of work in the background, and I think that really needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. The same amount of work is required. It's just one person normally doing it as opposed to maybe a panel of three or four or five sometimes. Um, and I feel from the staff who may be providing recollections or having informal meetings or phone calls mm -hmm. that it has been a less stressful experience for them as well. That's good. So, That's yeah. good to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose what I found, what I thought might be useful for any other case officers, potential case officers out there, is just to give some learning or some, some tips that I have, have come across. Um, in one case, the terms of reference didn't actually notify or um, identify who the commissioner was. So when I went to meet with the review panel, they didn't know who the chair was, or sorry, not the commissioner, the chair, and I didn't know who the chair was. And it was an oversight, I think, by the commissioner um, or maybe by the stint. So I think it's important to have that uh, clarified before uh, any communication or official meeting happens with the review panel. Um, the gathering and mapping of information well in advance. And I know the framework would say that the case report should go to them a week before. But in my experience, if, if you want to have as much as possible mm -hmm. with you as the case officer to inform the process on the day, mm -hmm. I feel that it would be useful to get that out to them at least two weeks in advance and ask them to come back a week later so that then you have another little bit of time to gather anything additional that they may look for. There may be policies and procedures that you don't know of that they're aware of okay. or nice yeah. guidance or you know, yeah. an international guidance mm -hmm. that, that they want brought. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really important. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to stress that with them, that if they don't do that, because I've, I've gone to review panel meetings or other meetings, and nobody has opened the file that you've given them until the day you sit down. So you have another hour or two to tread through all of that data. And if you have a very complicated case, that could take a whole day in itself, just looking at that. So that preparation is so important. Um, so yeah. Then also, I think on the day when you're going, being cognizant of your role as both an educator and a facilitator, I've found it really useful to have some props with me 
Um, so sometimes to have either like a little presentation or to have some handouts there to go through the systems analysis piece and to talk through that so that there's a general understanding of what's expected. Um, I think reading through the chronology in a systematic way can be quite useful as well. So sometimes you go and you could have maybe three and everyone's jumping in with, um, with their piece, which is very important, but if you try and uh, maybe either let each person give their say in totality or read down through it, and as you're going through each entry, everybody has their say. So at least nothing is missed and nothing falls between the cracks then. Um, again, bringing any relevant documents, including policy procedures, guidelines, whether they're local and or national may be relevant as well. Um, and I think having good definitions on, you know, A4 printed out and laminated that you can use for all of your, um, all of your reviews, not just this. Um, you know, what is a key causal factor? What is an incidental finding? What are contributory factors? Um, and having those with you, as well as handouts on the contributory factor framework. Mm -hmm. Having post-its, I found, is really useful because as you're trying to go through your steps and identify your key causal factors, people tend to go off in a tangent and they're identifying mm -hmm. recommendations and they're identifying things that should be done. And it's very hard to, to pull people back in and to try and stick to each step in the process, and you can very easily get lost. So even allowing them to stick down a thought on a post-it gives them that uh, security that we won't forget it. And you can have it there, and you can bring it back and move it around when you're trying to map things out. So that can be quite useful. And again, just being flexible within the framework. Um, some props that I just find useful in terms of bringing with you or, or having somebody provide locally if you're going out to meet a team, Having a flip chart and markers can be quite good. Your, your post-its, the definitions, laminated, and out on the contributing factor framework. And I've, I found the fishbone diagram really useful when you're trying to get people to focus on an actual problem or an issue, um, and then use the, the, both the uh, contributing factor framework, the Yorkshire one, but have your problem in that head of the fish there. So that it helps people to focus instead of going on to other incidental findings or other key causal factors. So there, there could be a number of them. Um, so I think that's most of my experience in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah great. We'll just move to Loretta to hear about the training to support this. Hi, I want to discuss the training with you um, in terms of support for the review power approach, as Siobhan said. And there's three different um, days here, or three and a half. We have managing an incident, which is a one day's training. We have introduction to systems analysis, again, a one day training, and facilitation skills. Um, and I know that somebody asked there about systems analysis training earlier on. That, as I say, is a full day training. And in the morning, it's um, presentation and discussion systems analysis and the science behind it. And then in the afternoon session, then, it's a, it's a, a session where we look at um, a particular incident and we, we uh, map it out according to the Yorkshire framework. So it's an interactive session and um, we've had very positive feedback on it. We, we tried it for the first time um, there in January and it, it, it has worked very well. Um, as Siobhan said, when the Instant Management Framework first started, uh, was first launched in uh, January 2018, we went out and we did engagement meetings with people uh, across the organization. And the feedback was that people wanted to have facilitation skills training. So we have developed um, a co-design and a co-delivery approach with the RCSI. And that's a day and a half training. Um, we had our first session, uh, our first training session on the 19th of January, and it's only as soon as today that we had the feedback on that, and had the, the feedback is, is it was very good. Now, the day consists of, I suppose, there's three parts to it, where the, the start of it is we talk about the program design, the second part of it is where we talk about facilitation skills, and then the third part of it is it's, it's the new way of doing the training. It's similar to that in AER where we use actors, where we use actors and facilitation skills as well, where we have, we use what we call a forum theater approach, where we have a particular scenario, our actors, then they take on a specific role, and then we have our, our facilitators then who would be facilitating the review, the review panel people, and we go through the process. Now, of, of the actual facilitation meeting. 
And what we have is thoughts in your head, which is, again, a new approach where the people who are facilitating the meeting or the actors can at any point put their hand up and say thoughts in their head, and they're going to give this that say that they are they don't know where they're going with the meeting at this time, or they're stuck, or can people in the audience help them? So it's a very safe environment for people to learn in and to learn how to deal with a particular situation. Also, what we found was the ability of the people in the room, there's a significant amount of skill, so one person can help the other in terms of that training. As I say, we had our first session on the 19th of January, and the group will meet again on, in six weeks' time, where we'll identify how they got on with the meeting that they facilitated during the, during the gap. Um, and just to say then, our training perspectives will be available this week, our QRS training perspectives. We would encourage you to um, keep an eye out for that. We will send um, an email or broadcast on it. But to keep an eye out for that, because places do fill up very quickly. Um, and we can move on to the next slide there. And then in terms of support that people need, that's our um, website that um, you can get the supports for, for QRS on there. Um, just wondering, one thing that struck me, is there a national, is there a national panel of reviewers available? Um, no, not at this time. We, we don't intend to develop a, a, national, a national panel of reviewers. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is do the training so we'll have capacity in the system to be able to do that. Because the, the purpose of reviewing an incident is to identify learning. So we want to get to a stage where, um, as Loretta said, the closer it is to the service, mm -hmm. um, the service are, is reviewing what happened rather than the review being done to them. So it, it, it just helps people mm -hmm. to make any improvements because they, um, they own mm -hmm. the improvements. And I think, um, for, certainly for the review panel approach, um, as Ines said, it is important that um, the people on the review are sufficiently removed, mm -hmm. um, and that's the term in the incident management framework. But it can be within the same CHO um, or hospital group, but just not directly involved with the service. And just regarding the training, um, as I said, there probably will be high demand for, for the training on those the three different areas you talked about. And is there, um, I suppose, plans to have a, a train-the-trainer type approach or a more local um, one-day quick snap kind of you know training as well to support that? We've had requests from the system in terms of providing training locally. But um, we don't have capacity ourselves to do that. What we're encouraging people to do is to, um, as soon as their perspectives comes out, to book in as soon as they can. Great, and hopefully these QI talk times will have people as well. Um, I must say it's been great to hear the, the local experience. I think that's really relevant, those practical tips and tools that, that people could adopt. Uh, Kira Kirk has said good insights about the need for more than one review panel meeting. Would booking panels for two to three meetings at the outset be a good approach? So you're preempting that. I think it would be useful to let them know that it's a possibility. Yeah, I'm not sure if you book actual dates, how it would work in terms of it. Can, it can trying to guess some information can be delayed sometimes. Um, but you know, you can always set out three or four provisional dates and see if they're required or not. And I think once people know that it is two meetings or three meetings, mm -hmm. you know, they know that they're not going to have to give up months yeah, to get yeah. through the review. But well, sometimes a half day is enough because mm -hmm. it can be so intense that sometimes, you know, nine to one or whatever, it can be enough for people to say, you know what, I've had enough today, yeah. can we meet next week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, um, the chat box has gone a bit quiet there. I don't see any further questions coming in. Um, you've got one minute before we close off on the questions, but I suppose just firstly, I just want to thank um, Loretta, Siobhan, Annette and Una for giving us their time today. Um, really useful webinar and I hope it's given everyone some food for thought um, and great practical tips and tools that people can adopt locally. Um, certainly go on to the website for any further information and do join in to our next webinar, which will um, be following up on this on after action reviews. Um, so, I'll just
pull that up here. Um, so we also have web and, uh, a space on the web, qualityimprovement.ie, and within there you'll find the QI Talk Time web page where this will be available after, along with the slide set, so you can watch the back retrospectively. So if you're in an organisation and you think there's people that need to hear more about this, direct them on to this. It will be up by the end of the week. And then just the next webinar is Tuesday the 19th of February, again at lunchtime, and it's on the incident management framework um, after action review. And I think some of the people here with me today will be here following up on that the next day. So thank you very much again to our panel and great discussion. And we'll see you all hopefully again in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Thank you.